Have you ever been working on a painting where you have something great going on in it, but overall it's just not working? And you don't have the courage to scrape that thing out that is working for the good of the whole painting? I'm Scott Ruthven. Today I've got a video for you where I tape the painting of this from start to finish in a time-lapse fashion. And I'm going to talk through, as you will see, how I struggled from the start to the finish to get the effects that I wanted. I had to scrape this thing out, elements of it out, over and over again. Now, scraping something out that's working is hard to do. I get it. But I guess if you did it once, you can figure out how to do it again. And if you can't, it was just an accident anyway, and you probably need some practice. So summon the courage, scrape that thing out that is working. If you can't, get the rest of the painting to work and build the painting as a whole together. Now, oil paints are a very forgiving medium. And the cradle panel that I used here uh, allowed me to scrape down over and over again without hurting the surface. So let's talk a little bit about the materials that I used. Like I said, the cradle panel here, they're by Jack Richardson, and they are a cradled hardboard, and they're coated with an acrylic gesso. The texture on this that the surface has is similar to an eggshell. And because it is acrylic gesso, that first layer of paint that you put on is going to stain the surface, which you can really use to your advantage because subsequent layers of paint can be scraped off or you can scratch through them and reveal that under color, the, the very first color that you put on. So a really cool way to get an unusual effect with these. Now they're, they're called cradled. These are cradled because you can see there's a little frame here that they're mounted to. And that just provides rigidity. These are three quarter inch deep. You can also get these um, just by themselves, it's just the hard panel. You can see here there's no cradle on the back. And that's fine, same surface. Uh, I chose to use the cradle one here. And, uh, but again, the same surface, both are from Jack Richardson. The brushes I use today are flats and filberts. You can get a bunch, but I use flats and filberts. And I predominantly use sizes anywhere from four to eight in this painting. I've also used a palette knife extensively in this painting, as I do in all my paintings. I think it's really cool to have a mix of brushwork and palette knife. Having all brush or all palette knife gets a bit repetitive, so I really like the palette knife. I used it a bit more than usual uh, in this painting in particular. Uh, the one I use is, uh, this is the T6, and it is by Creative Mark. I'll leave a link in the description for it as well. Now. This is a tool that takes a little bit of practice to use effectively, but it's really worth it. Don't avoid these. Um, <laughs> they're a great tool. You can smear paint on, you can use them to create lines, you can use the tip of them to scratch through paint. Very versatile tool. Every artist, every painter should be having and using uh, a palette knife in their work. And lastly, the palette of colors that I have. It's my normal palette. I uh, use the same colors, whether I'm painting outdoors or indoors. Um, and so here's the list of colors here and the layout on my palette. And uh, I'll put a link to every one of those in the description below this video as well. So if there's a color you're not uh, used to or want to try, uh, you can follow a link there and, and see the brands that I use. I'm an artist in Colorado and I make videos about art, art materials, and the art life to help other people who want to learn art. If you like my content, found something valuable, please hit that like button. It really helps me to build my channel and reach more people. I also invite you to subscribe to my channel. And that way, any new video I put out, you'll get to see it. Now, let's get into this demo. Starting here with a tone of burnt sienna on the panel choosing that because the foreground is going to be um, need to be warm the ground earth coming through I'll wipe that top down though because it's gonna be mostly sky don't need to fight that color and now you see I'm measuring where's my horizon this is really important I don't want that right in the middle of the panel and let's get some drawing in here the shapes are going to be really important to this piece they're important to all pieces but I really want to make sure that uh, the composition is strong here and it's really shape driven. Now I'll place that moon in there, which is really important because it's kind of the focal point, right? 
Ah, uh, and I jump right into paint it. Now watch how precious I go about painting this moon. I go right for it. I think, man, I'm just gonna paint this thing exactly the way I want it. One and done, it's gonna be perfect. So I am really, and keep in mind this is sped up, so right, I am just trying to get this exactly what I want. This is, this is finished painting marks right here. See how long that lasts, huh? Just finessing it, you know, it's a ball, so I'm put, employing all the principles of light on form here. Love it. Oh my gosh. Now we'll get a little sky going on in here. This should really set that moon apart. Just carve right into it. Now a tip here actually I'll bring up is, uh, notice I, I painted the moon first and it's kind of a practical thing to do because if I had tried to paint the sky in first and then paint the moon, as I'm painting that lighter color of the moon, I'd be picking up this blue, right? And then it would bring that blue into the colors of the moon, which I didn't want to do. It doesn't matter if I've already painted the moon and I bring the blue up to it, it doesn't matter if I pick up a little of that moon color into the blue. In fact, it's something I would prefer in this case to give a little of that effect of the, uh, the shine from the, the moon into the sky. And I'm just gradating my colors as I go down here. I'm working off of a plein air piece that I did a few nights earlier, a little eight inch square panel I, I did on location at, uh, as the moon was rising in our town. So I'm referring to that, but I decided, um, you know, to make some very specific changes compared to the plein air piece here, so. But I liked how that moon was coming up behind the clouds on the, um, along the horizon there, this is uh, the moon, when it comes up, man, right at the horizon, it seems like it's huge, bigger than life. And then the higher it goes in the sky, of course, and the smaller it gets. So this was just after the rise here. And you'll see, I've got to kind of figure out the, the right size to make that moon. But oh, this is just the beginning. <laughs> I'm painting so, so good here, I think. Uh, Oof, just gonna do it. But as you'll see here in a few minutes, I decide it's not going where I want it to. So there's, you saw quickly there, me scraping off with the palette knife a little bit, just removing up the buildup of paint um, at that stage, but not really trying to scrape it out. Again, some finesse. No, I didn't like that, so I've just come right in with a rag and, and wiped that cloud out. So there's uh, adjustment number one, let's say. So I'll try it again. Oh, okay. Now we see the moon. The moon is gone. I just went right in and wiped that whole sucker right out. And, you know, I overdid it. I've met, now I have a big, a big shape of a moon there. Uh, the reason being, again, I can come back in and cut that down in size with the blue sky color. But my precious moon, I just, you know, without hesitation, it wasn't what I wanted, and I scraped all that paint off the palette knife. Like start fresh. Now what you see there, I'm taking a little of the paint off the edges, scraping it up, because I don't want a buildup of thick paint uh, this really, the moon is off in the distance and I want it soft and hazy. Now I'm trimming it down, get it the right size. This brush is an ivory curved long flat from Rosemary and Company. All right, now I'm gonna put a little of the light, a little of the light hitting those clouds that are in front of the moon here. But it isn't gonna last long here. Right away, I don't like it and scrape it off. Try it again. All right, that's a little better. 
Now I'm just integrating everything with that sky color again. I get the gradation I want. All right, let's break out the palette knife here. So I start thinking, uh, yeah, I need a little texture. I need to liven it up. It's a little bit boring here. And so you'll see me just picking up paint with that knife and relaying it down in other areas. Not treating anything too as too valuable here. Just going right into the moon even. Now look at how that sky has changed with a little palette knife work. A lot more interesting. Oh, and then I'm popping in some blue to make that darker blue to make the moon pop. And yeah, very different feel all of a sudden. So I went from painting real delicate that moon to now being pretty heavy handed with a palette knife here, seeing where it's going, what develops. Now let's pause it right here. I really like the way this looked. And in a different painting, I love the texture and where this was going, but it didn't match where I wanted this painting to go. I needed this to be softer. And um, while this was what I felt was a really interesting bunch of marks, a lot of energy. It just wasn't where I wanted to go in this painting, given what I had as an idea and concept for the foreground. So, bam, there we go. I scrape it all off. Now what you'll notice here, look at that sky, it's smoothed out. Actually, after I scraped it down with the palette knife, I had to change my battery or something, I don't remember, but there's a little gap here. And I was interested, there was enough paint left on the surface, I used my fingertips to smooth out the marks that were left from troweling out the paint with the palette knife. And there was enough paint and it was, the palette or the, uh, the board was stained enough to where that sky really had the right texture, wasn't too much paint, it was soft, that was what I was looking for. Now I'm painting, there's a, a bank of clouds right at the horizon there that are all sorts of uh, blues and violets and mauve tones in there. Just gorgeous colors, I definitely want to get that. And that little smear below the moon, by the way, is the reflection in, in the painting. I think I showed that, uh, the finished painting at the start, but that's what that piece is going to be. Now I'll get into painting that beginning of the land mass way off in the distance there. And here's the water. Now you notice I'm back to the brush. Well, for a minute. So I'm using the, the palette knife to scrape out paint I don't want, really, but I'm not painting with it like I did uh, in the sky a little bit ago. So I'll get most of my paint in, and this is how I, I do it quite often, is I'll put a lot of my paint in with the brush, and then I'll move it around and create those edges and, and such with the palette knife, and then even come back again with the brush. But right now, what's most important is the, the value, the dark to light nature of that water there. Because this is just the very first pass of, of many that'll go into building this water up. Now I'm getting that knife out and gonna actually paint with it. Although there's no new paint on the knife blade, I'm just using it to pick up and move around the, the paint I've already laid down with the brush. And um, it gives it more of a, what I would call a painterly, for lack of a, a better, more descriptive word, but add some texture uh, to the paint surface. And now I'm actually picking up some lighter colored paint with the knife and applying it. Some of that sky shine that happens on the, uh, the plane of the water as it's further away from you. It's starting to come together. You know, it's reading pretty well right now. 
But I have this challenge here now to integrate the reflection of the moon into that water without uh, any so naturalistic, but not overdone. And you're going to see me struggle with this. I will do this over and over. So there's round one. Put it in, scraped it off, didn't like it. Now I got to put some more blue in and keep that water all working together. So I may like the water, one little aspect of it, but if I can't get that moon to integrate in there, I got to script the whole thing out and start over, paint that whole body of water again. Now this little tool is uh, by Catalyst. It's called a W-01 and it's a silicon spatula. And uh, wow, a great little tool for certain jobs. A different feel than a palette knife though. I'll put a link in the description below. Now I need to put a little bit of a lighter reflection on top of that water in the background. Let's see if I can do that here. Boy, that's looking pretty bright. Too high a value, I think. Yep, let's scrape that out. Start over. Eh. But hey, it left a little bit of a ghost image on top of there that's about the right value, light and dark. But here we go again with that moon. Scraped it out, trying something new, that reflection there in the water. And so it goes over and over again. But you know what, if you settle and you look at that painting on a gallery wall later, you're gonna say, ah, oh, I'm not happy with the moon, the reflection there, or whatever it is, right? So don't give up on it, keep working, and be courageous. The process here to scrape it off, as, as you've seen me do over and over again, is so easy. Um, really, the tough part is just the mental part of bringing yourself to scrape out something that isn't quite working. Uh, even if you have to scrape off the whole section of water in this case, because one element isn't working. It's the only way to, to move forward and it helps you progress not only that painting, but your skills overall as a painter. As you can see, I've started to work on some of the trees in the Oh, middle ground, I guess, here. And, you know, this is a common trick. I've left the shine of the moon, the reflection of the moon alone now. I wasn't getting it. So rather than just keep hammering at that, I'm not in the right space to get that uh, the way I want it. I'm going to shift gears and work on the, the trees here for a little bit. Um, and so that's a great trick. Sometimes you just need to get away from that thing that you're struggling with for a little bit. Work on something uh, you, you're different or something you're more comfortable with and can have some success on, and then come back to that other thing later. The other part of that, though, really is if I had this other element, I'm building these trees in here now. With those in the painting, that's going to impact how the rest of the painting looks as well. So I will work on the water later, but it's all going to be in relation to um, the painting as a whole, which will now have trees in it. I'm switching back and forth here between the palette knife and the brush just to really finesse that edge. There's so much variety in that edge uh, that I can get with those two tools here and I really want to bring in the light airy nature of that top of that tree as it turns uh, into the atmosphere. But as you're about to see, even the tree isn't safe. Now see how that ghosted image stays there on this hardboard? I really like that. So I, I know what's there, I've got something to build on, and even though I've scraped it out with the palette knife, uh, really the colors and the image are still, a ghost of that is still there. And I'll attempt it again here, till I get it right. Now introducing this little tree um, that's basically in the water, on the edge of the water, but it's you know painted into the water there, makes managing the water a little more difficult. I need to paint this tree very intentionally because I really only get one shot, or again, I'm gonna have to scrape out not only the tree, but a good portion of that water. These trees in the middle ground, the smaller ones there, they seem a little warm compared to the one in the foreground on the right. So I'm trying to cool it down, but 
it's just not working. So here I go, scraping the trees out. I think this is the second time I'll try again. And you know what? Let's just try it one more time here on the trees. Oh my gosh. With a little paper towel, a little bit of pressure on a paper towel, I was able to wipe away all that paint back to the original burnt sienna tone on the uh, hardboard there. And we start again. But the, the key is with this that uh, as I scrape away, I can work a painting over and over, an area over and over again, and each time it looks fresh because it is. I've, I've basically made a clean slate. I'm going to take another shot at it, and hopefully with a little more of uh, an assured hand and a vision of where I want to go with it, and so the end result is um, looks more spontaneous even though it was very laborious. Using that sky color, I'm going to go back in and help define that outer edge of the tree by carving into it and even putting some sky holes in there where the uh, sky is showing through the openings in the tree. All right, let's get going on this foreground here. This brush is in the Grand Prix line from Silver Brush Company. It's a filbert size 8 and it's a natural hog's hair. Now the foreground's in shadow, so it has to be a darker form, but not so dark that you can't see some of the detail in it. It's also a bunch of grass, and I want to portray that texture and actually contrast the texture of that foreground with the nice smooth um, feeling of the sky and the moon and the clouds off in the distance. To help build that texture, I'm, you'll notice I'm changing the, the color mixture on my brush, my palette knife, uh, every few strokes, just keeping a mixture here, a variety. I'm not so happy with the foreground either, so I first try to smooth it all out with a brush, get an even tone of color, which I could make as my base. But I think there's too much paint ultimately, and I scrape it off with the palette knife as well. Again, leaving that ghost image there that uh, provides a foundation to build upon, so not at all is lost there. Alright, so now I'm really going to break into the tools, the palette knife, even that silicone spatula, and try to get some interesting texture going on there. And, um,. Some things I like and others I don't, but I'm going to keep working it here. I like this cool violet color in the shadow. And now I'm going to add some kind of highlights to the top of the grass where it's catching some of that light from the, the moon. And it's nice and cool to add to that effect of the, uh, the cool evening. Now I'm putting in some warmer highlights toward the foreground here. And watch how this adds dimension to that foreground. When I put these lights up against those violet darks in the shadow that I had put in just a moment ago, it really starts to create a structure that you can feel, some dimension in that foreground, rather than just a flat plane. Here's that palette knife again, adding some random textures in here with it. It's just a great tool for that. Let's shift gears and go finesse this water a little bit. Now I always fall into this trap. I'm really working and finessing that water, right? But I don't have the moon reflection in yet. So I am likely to have to repaint all of this if I don't get that right when I decide to put it in. One of the things I remember when I was plein air painting though in this scene is there were bands of uh, when water is still, but you have little areas where wind is blowing across it, creating some ripple. Those ripples reflect the sky, and the areas that are smooth are much darker, and I remembered that pattern, so I decided to put that in here. Now you might wonder what I'm doing here. I'm just using a brush to selectively soften and actually get rid of some paint ridges that are reflecting the overhead light in a way that kind of detracts from the, uh, the effect of the painting. 
Although it's sped up, the painting at this stage is much more deliberate. It's slowed down and I'm refining some of the details. I'm putting, um, you know, juxtaposing warm and cool and creating atmosphere that way uh, with subtle temperature shifts in, in color. I'm also refining the shape of my trees and everything in here as I go. Oftentimes at this stage, what's missing to really make a convincing shape is uh, a few good darks. So let me lay some in here and look at how this tree changes. You don't want to go overboard, but I see this a lot with students as well, especially in the foreground. Some good strong darks really anchor that foreground. You couldn't put a big strong dark in that far background, right, or it would bring it forward because it's way back there, so there's not that contrast of values. But um, in these shapes here in the foreground, those darks really anchor them and bring them forward. And with that foreground in now, I can better judge the rest of the painting and I see that the lights in the water could be brought up even a little bit lighter than I had them. So I'm going to reestablish some of those and, and heighten that lightness a little bit more. And the moon even needs a little more work here, adding a little more color to it. Now this looks like a million little brush strokes, but I have to be really careful here. I don't want the size of the moon to grow and that would naturally happen if I'm not paying attention. And I'm smoothing it down because I really want that soft glow look. I don't want to destroy that with too much paint and even using my fingers here. And a quick check just to make sure that shoreline is level and flat. Ah, now what if I had been avoiding this entire time? You guessed it, that reflection of the moon. Here are the palette knives I've been using in this painting. The top one is a Scuola, and it's made in Italy, and the shape is SC1, that's the one on top here. The other one is a little bit bigger and different head shape. It's the T6 by Creative Mark. I'll add some links below for them. This little brush is the Legion by Trickell, and it's the 9100KF, a nice soft synthetic bristle. Hey, now that was fun. I hope you enjoyed the demo and you found something useful. Just a reminder, your likes, comments, and shares help me build my channel. They tell YouTube that my content is worth sharing. And that lets me reach other people who are trying to learn about art. And that's really what's important to me. Now, I'd like to hear from you. Two things. Would you go in the comments below and let me know, first of all, what was something from this video that you learned or an aha moment that you'll take away and implement in your own work? And two, what is something that you want to learn about that you'd like to see me make a video on in the future? And until next time, I'll see you then.